unrestrained, unashamed, unrestrained, unashamed, unashamed, unrestrained, 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 unrestrained. Yes,
Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's stand this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and start or open up our Sunday school class here in just a moment. We're going to turn it over to Nick, and Nick's going to be teaching this morning. So uh, we'll uh, enjoy some of his study. And so, but let's pray and ask God to use him to minister to us. And we have to we have to connect with with what he's speaking about. Isn't that right? You know, we have to connect with it. It's not going to do us any good if we don't connect to it. So we got to open our heart to receive the Word of God today so that the Word will speak to us. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, again. We're in your house. This is your house, oh God. We come in here, Lord, to honor you, to glorify you. Lord, to respect your presence. <coughs> so, Lord, today we pray, let the Holy Ghost, Lord, minister to us. Let your word, your word, which is spirit and life, impart into our heart, into our mind today. God, that you may minister to us through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let your hand be upon us today, I pray, God. We open our hearts to you. We open our minds to you, O oh God, to allow your word to speak into our lives. We we pray it all in the mighty name of the one true and living God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, Brother Nick. Come on up and uh, turn it over to you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. So pastor always opens with a joke, so I asked him where he gets his jokes. Again, for like the 10th time, he will not tell me where he gets his jokes. So I had to find my own. So here's my joke. A young couple came into the church office to fill out a pre-marriage questionnaire form. The young man who had never talked to a pastor before was quite nervous, and the pastor tried to put him at ease. When they came to the question, are you entering this marriage of your own free will, there was a long pause. Finally, the girl looked over at the apprehensive young man and said, put down yes. <laughs> it's the best I could come up with. So I will also tell you that this is not my title, but Sister Janie really wanted me to make my title who's there because pastor spoke on knock knock last week, but it did not go with it. So I couldn't do that, but she wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. So, I'm going to start in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. It says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and the bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone, against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. And then I'm going to skip back to Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 through 16. And it says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest, and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now, Mary, and Mary made a decision and Judas made a decision. We all make our own decisions. We all have free will. We each take into consideration different things. When I'm thinking of something, I do not think the same way Pastor does. And Mary took into consideration her spiritual well-being, while Judas took into consideration his worldly well-being. Which, if you know anything about the story of Judas, 
at the end of the story, it did not end well for him. He committed suicide, if you didn't know. When I was in high school, I went to every sporting event, every single one. I literally, like, they would literally just let me in free by, like, halfway through the season because they're like, you don't even, should, shouldn't even have to pay anymore. But there was one night, there was a girls' basketball game, and I asked to go, and dad told me no. So in about 30 seconds, I came up with a bulletproof plan that I was going to get to this game and not get caught. Now that I am 25, I look back on this plan and think, that was really, really bad. But I told my mom I was going upstairs to read a book, which was clue number one that I was not staying upstairs. <laughs> then I went to Patrick and told him, if mom and dad ask, just tell them I'm upstairs reading this book and I'm really into it. That was clue number two. But that was my contingency plan just in case. So later, they called, they called for Pat and said, go tell your brother to come down for dinner. Well, Patrick, not being reliable, <laughs> c comes back downstairs and says he's not up there. So then I get a phone call from my dad, which I thought was really smart that I would go up. If you've ever been to the girls' gym in Ravenswood, if you go to the very top, it's just as loud as down at the bottom. But I thought he's not going to be here to hear anything in the background. So he says, where are you at? And with my obvious answer, I'm up in my bedroom reading a book. He then asks again, I'm up in my bedroom reading a book. So then he says, I'm sitting outside the doors. You have five seconds to get out here. <laughs> I then hurried and got to the car. In that story, I made four moves that were not in my best interest. And one that was, the ones that weren't, lying to my mom about reading, trusting in Pat, <laughs> or getting him to lie for me, sneaking out the window and jumping off the roof, and then lying on the phone to dad. The one move I did make that was in my interest was running to the car. <laughs> How many decisions do we make, good and bad? The Judas, in John chapter, in John chapter 12, verse through four and five, it said that he was criticizing Mary while she was washing Jesus' feet for pouring the perfume on Jesus. The spikenard, which I looked up at now, and it depends on the size you buy, which everything does, but the one of the bigger sizes was right around $2,000. It really wasn't that big of a bottle. It wasn't even as big as a shampoo bottle, but this perfume cost would have costed her 300 days of work. They got one pence per day. That's 300 days of work. And Judas is saying you could give that money to the poor. Well, he didn't want to give the money to the poor. He wanted the money for himself. But you see, what Judas did was you saw Mary made the move that she was going to take that small amount of oil that she did have and work on her spiritual well-being with Jesus. But then you see Judas, he made the move not knowing the consequences of his move. He thought that his move would just get Jesus arrested, but it was more severe than that. It ended up Jesus dying on the cross. We all have made decisions not knowing how bad the consequences could be. I wasn't sure what the consequences would be for sneaking out of the house and going to that basketball game, but I will tell you, the whipping hurt really bad, and the grounding was just as bad. But we must watch every move we make even the smallest moves. I did some research on the human brain, and if you know me, I'm not very good at research, so this is what I could get. Decision-making is made in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, and I tried to find more information on those two things, and they're, that's really what they do. That's about it. But it takes about 10 seconds to make a decision. So for dad to decide that he wanted me to speak today, it took him about 10 seconds. How many decisions do you think are made in a given day by an average person that sleeps seven hours a night? Brother Tom, how many decisions do you think 
for a person that sleeps seven hours a night in a day? Pastor? It's 35,000 decisions a day, which turns out to be 2,000 choices per hour, and that's one decision every two seconds. But we look at that, it takes 10 seconds to make a decision. We unconsciously make decisions before these things. How does anyone expect us to make every right decision every day? I was speaking with pastor on Wednesday on how hard it is to teach rather than preach. And for me, both of them are extremely hard. But if you're most of a lot of people in here are teachers, teaching is way more difficult because you're trying to get them to actually learn something. And, And but he said one thing that really was when I heard it, I thought, well, yeah, I know that. But at the same time, I'm thinking, duh, I, I should have already, I, why did I even ask? But he said, teaching and preaching are prepared the same way, always through prayer. Each decision we make is through prayer. I am not suggesting that every time you go to do something, you stop and pray about your decision. You know, I really wanted Burger King last night. I did not stop and say, God, should I get Burger King? I just went and got Burger King. It's, I mean, it's just not every decision is like that. But on a daily basis, before our feet should hit the ground, we should be praying and saying, God, please guide my steps today. We need to, we need to ask him to look over me so that I, ha- I walk the path that you provided. Every day we come up to certain decisions that need to be made. Should I go out with this friend? Should I go out with this friend? But in reality... The decision, when you are thinking about it, shouldn't be that hard of a decision when you're, if you prayed about it. If you prayed daily, these decisions are made so much easier. We have to make the decision to be separate from the world in 2 Corinthians six fifteen through 17. In the NIV version, it says, what harmony is there between Christ and Belial, or the devil? So it's, what harmony is there between Christ and the devil? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with him, with them, and walk among them, and I will be there, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from, the, from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. That right there is Paul just telling us that he's comparing believers and non-believers. He compared, uh, he believed, oh my gosh, he he compared (laughs) Christ to the devil. There's no comparison there. That is apples and oranges. And we have to understand that we have to be separate. And by making those decisions, we are being separate. Every day in this world, we are making decisions. And I know the teen class is in here, so I will say this really quick. And I do not talk to you guys about this at all because it's a very uncomfortable situation being only 25. But I will tell you anyways. When it comes to dating, serious dating, not high school dating where you're with them for a week or two days or whatever it is. But serious dating is almost impossible. You like someone, but they aren't in church, which happens all the time. I dated, I don't know how many people that weren't in church. But they can pull you away from your faith, not because they're meaning to pull you away from your faith, but because you're following them. And you have to make that decision before you start dating them. Would you rather date them and be pulled away from the church, or would you rather just be in church? You know, I'll say this, and I'll probably get in trouble for it, but when I met Kelsey, she, we did not have the same beliefs. Before we started dating, I invited her to church. And you can ask Sister Janie this. I told, I told her, if she doesn't want to come to church, then I'm not going to date her. 
because I couldn't take that chance to be pulled away. And your partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, needs to bring you closer to God, not farther away. If you're in a relationship that is pulling you from the church, you need to get out of that relationship. I was reading one of Dad's books, and it was it said, not just for the young people, but seasoned believers, there can be no spiritual equality between believers and unbelievers, and to ignore the call to separation is to flirt with spiritual suicide. And when I'm, I was reading that, and I was... I was thinking about today and what I was going to speak on. And that's the difference between believers and non-believers. We don't, we take that into consideration every day. Every day we think about, well, this is what the world does. This is what I need to do. But the question is, am I doing it enough? Have I made the move to be far away enough from the world? Each, each of us m- must make our move. God can't make that move for us. He sets the path to, for us to follow it. Every move has a fork in the road. There's an old nursery rhyme that I think everyone in here should know. It's a pretty easy one. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. That tells you right there that you can't sit on the fence. Sitting on the fence forever is impossible. And I was speaking with Sister Janie yesterday about using that. And one thing she said was, you can mention that sitting on a wall is a lot simpler than sitting on a fence. Because sitting on a wall is a lot harder. It has, it's sturdier. Sitting on a fence can just fall. You know, at my house, if you've ever been to my house, my fence looks like this. Not because I did anything to it, and not because I put anything on it, but fences fall. If you're on the fence, you have to make the move to separate yourself from the world, especially the world we live in now. We shouldn't be on the fence, but we shouldn't even be near the fence. We have to understand that Jesus didn't die for us to flirt with sin and repent before we go to bed. You know, I can stand right here, right next to a fence and lean up against it and say, well, I'm not sitting on the fence. Or I can be way over here, nowhere near the fence, and make that decision and make that move to be, you know, I don't want to get near the fence because I don't know what's on the other side of that fence. We have to understand that this fence was put here for a reason. Repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry, but tomorrow I'm going to do the same thing I did today. You know, when I was a kid, I always took money out of my mom's purse. How much money I took out of her purse is probably a lot. Did she know that? I don't know. She just shook her head yes, so apparently she did. But at night, I would go, after I stole her money, I'd go upstairs and say, Jesus, I won't, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'd be the end of the story until the next day, and I needed five more dollars. You know, that's not how repentance works. It's saying, God, I'm sorry, but it's also making the move not to do it again. We can't be desensitized to sin. It's impossible to not be desensitized by sin when you are trying to live on the fence. Like I said, if you stand beside the fence and you lean up against the fence, the fence always ends up falling. If you lean anything up against the fence, it's not going to stand there forever. When I was in college, one of my friends that... I don't even speak to anymore, asked me to be his designated driver because he was going to go to the bar. And I said, just text me when you need a ride. I'll come pick you up. If you have any other friends that need a ride, I'll give them a ride home. I don't want you guys driving. So 
in my mind, I'm thinking I'm being a really good friend by going and picking him up. But then it was, well, I'll just go with him. That way he doesn't have to text me. I'll take my own bottle of water. I'll stick it in my back pocket so no one can steal it and do whatever. Because if you know my friends, they would. But then it was, well, you know, it's okay to drink a little bit because it ain't going to hurt nothing. But we see that, and I say that, and then before I came home, when Dad had his surgery, I was like, you know, I probably shouldn't be doing this anymore. But, you know, Mom and Dad don't know, don't hurt them, you know, it is what it is. And then Dad ended up having to have his surgery, and I decided, well, I should probably go home and help. You know, I, I made that move to go home and help. Did they need my help? No. I mean, the most I could do was mow the grass. But I made that move to go home and, and help out. And when I did that, I came back here. I didn't have that influence in my life. I mean, I, I don't even speak to him anymore. Once I left Marshall, I didn't hardly speak to him anymore. But that me sitting on the fence when I was in Huntington, and when I made that move to come back here, I decided, well, I'm not going to do that anymore, and I moved this way, just a little bit. So then it was, I was sitting on the pew on Sundays and Wednesdays. I was just sitting here, and pastor spoke. I can't even remember to this day what it was, but he spoke, and I decided I was going to make that move to be fully in the church. I was not going to do anything wrong ever again, and then the next day rolled around. And I, I was still saying I wasn't going to do anything wrong. But I had to make that decision on Monday when I wasn't in the church. Just because we sit on the pew in a church doesn't mean we're not backslidden. We have to make that move to love him instead of love the world. You know, me being here on Sunday made it really easy to me to make that move. But on Monday and Tuesday, when I was not here, made it a little more difficult. But if you read, read the King James Version of 1 John 2.15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things of that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But then if you read the NIV Version, which just makes it a little simpler, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. You know, that verse says it all right there. That verse tells us we've got to make the move to not love the world. You know, the things going on in the world right now are just crazy. You know, our, the church has been affected. With COVID, the church was affected. We didn't have service for four months, and we went online. Do I like doing online? Yes, I do. But it's still affecting the church because, you know, some people aren't going to come to church because they can conveniently watch it at home. But we got to make that move on Sundays and Wednesdays to be in church. And I told him I was not going to go very long. So I'm going to close, and then I'm going to have him come speak because I know he wants to. I can see it in his eyes. <laughs> but I'm going to close with this. The first question God ever asked in the Bible was in Genesis 3. He asked Adam and Eve, where are you? You know, that's the simplest question ever asked. When I, like I told you, when I was at the basketball game, dad called and he said, where are you? You know, it was a really simple answer. I'm at the basketball game. That's not what I said. I said, I'm at home. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve made that move to hide and not tell him. God knew where they were. God knows where we are. Each of us are all the time. But they made, that, they made that move not knowing the consequence that it was going to be too late. They were kicked out of the garden and separated from God. Judas did not realize his move to separate himself from Jesus would be as costly as it was. And that was Jesus dying on the cross. And later, Judas ended up returning the 30 pieces of silver, which nowadays is worth about $200. So he gave up Jesus for about $200. 
He returned it, and then he repented, and then he hung himself. He didn't see those consequences. Our, our consequences from our moves every day is something we don't look to in the future. You know, I don't, I don't look to see what's going to happen after church today. You know, after I, go, after I go to my parents to eat dinner, all I know is I'm going to go home. I don't know what I'm going to do after that. i got to make the move for that. But we got to realize our consequence of making these moves is missing heaven. We got to realize our consequences is one of these days we might not be in church because we decided this just wasn't that important. We each need to look and say, where are you? Where are we? What is my next move? Thank you. on there I am his lesson today on the power of choice which move you look through scripture and you're going to find over and over again starting with Adam and Eve do you realize all the all the power all of the problems that you have today are because of a decision a choice somebody made to disobey God and that choice to disobey God allows your sickness, your struggle with sin. You can trace all of your problems back to that one decision in the garden that somebody made because they were influenced, they were influenced by what the devil said. They were listening to someone, and because they were listening to the wrong voice, the decision they made allowed sin to come into the world, into a, at one time, perfect world. And when sin came into the world, it separated and broke the relationship between Adam and Eve and God. And that's why God said, where art thou? And Adam said, I hid myself. Because he knew. He knew what his choice had done. He knew what his decision had done. You can go on through the Bible. Samson's decision. Again, what was he doing? Hanging out with the wrong person. Allowing that voice into his life and her influence on him, and, and on and on through Scripture. And it came, comes down to your decisions, the importance of your decisions and what those decisions do in your life. I love the comparison between Judas and Mary. Now Mary chose to sit at the feet of worship. Mary chose her relationship with God, and Judas chose the world, <coughs> the influence of the world, rather than putting God first and seeking God first. Folks, you can't go wrong putting God first. You cannot go wrong if you, God will, God will take care of things if you'll put God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and what? All these things will be added unto you if you'll seek the kingdom of God first. And we 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 tend to get it get it backwards, and we we start. Th I was thinking today. I don't even know why I was thinking today about a situation where someone had come to us and uh, they were in a certain living situation that was not godly and they said uh, they were wanting to come to church, they were wanting to live for God and they said, but we don't want to change this living situation 
because of the money. Because of the money. And I said, my my question to them was simply this, do you want God's blessing or do you want the world's blessing? Do you want God's blessing or do you want the world's blessing? If you've got God's blessing, you've got unlimited blessing. But if you want the world's blessing, you're just going to get that check every month. So which blessing do you want? Do you want God's blessing where you make things right, you repent, you fix things, you get in the relationship the way you're supposed to be in the relationship, or you stay in this relationship and you just end up, your, it depends on where your faith is because their faith ended up being in the check. It ended up being in the check that, that they got every month rather than trusting God to, to supply all their needs according to his riches and glory. And that was their decision. That was their choice. And so they ended up not serving God and now they're all messed up and, and, and that's because of a choice they made. There's power in your choice. The choices you make. Let's stand. Good lesson. Very good lesson today. Very good lesson. I want God to help me make my choices. I want to weigh, weigh in the balance the choices that I make. Now, I, I agree. You don't have to pray about going to Burger King or not. And you definitely don't have to pray about going to Taco Bell. Don't go. But you do need to pray about the influences in your life. You do need to pray about the things you allow in your heart and your mind. You do need to pray and seek God. God, am I am I putting you first? Are you or am I putting something ahead of you? You do need to pray about those things. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for the word of the Lord today, the lesson that we've received, and God, the word that's been spoken into our life. Let this word take root in our heart. God, let this word influence us and help us, God, to choose and <coughs> to make the right decisions in our life. And God, let your hand be upon us, Lord. I, I pray, God, we always put you first. That, God, we seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness so that everything else, Lord, so that your blessing and your favor can be upon our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray always, God, that, Lord, you help us and lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, God that then surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. God, we pray it all, God. Let you let your spirit guide us. Let your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I pray it all in the name of our, my, our God, in the name of the only wise God. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. Now before we move, before we do anything, uh, it's good to see Clarence and Alice here. Absolutely thrilled. Give them a hand. For being here today, I want us. I want us to pray for them. Nick, where'd he go? Hell, he he got raptured quick. I want us to pray for them, and uh, I, I want you to reach your hands back toward them. A couple of the couple of the elders now are going to lay hands on them, Brother Pet. If you join me over there, and lay hands on them and pray for them, and ask God to touch them. There's uh, a lot going on that a lot of you probably don't even know about in this situation. So uh, I'm just going to ask you to join me in prayer. Ask God's healing, God's hand to be upon them.